and welcome to Trillium Place. Mr. David Simcock has kindly invited us here today. Um, and we want to talk to him about grassroots racing at the lower level. Obviously, he started at the low level, so he's a great man to give us his experience. Um, I don't know David that well, but from what I do know of him, he's a very, very nice man. And he always looks after us, up the gallops and everywhere else. Any help, Mr. Simcox, always there. So I look forward to this interview. David, can we start right from the beginning? I've tried to um, find a little bit out, out about you, but you're quite a hidden person. Um, so I'd like to start back from the, your days in Wales and horse racing and how you actually came into it. Yeah, I'm, I probably am. I keep myself to myself uh, more often than not. But, um, you know, I went to school in Wales for 10 years. Um, and my background, my parents are from Herefordshire. Uh, my father was always keen on racing. Um, he, um, he went racing with an owner called Joe Aylett back in the day. He was a big owner in our area. Um, used to drive him around, used to put his bets on. Um, and I can remember my earliest memories were watching Man Alive win the 1978 Maxson and watching racing every Saturday on TV. Um, and my father would have had a bet. Um, we'd watch the old ITV7 and I just got into it that way. It's really, really, really interesting. As, as I said, we can't find a lot about, about your background, so it's nice to hear that you started just from a normal background, like grassroots, we call it grassroots. Very much so. I mean, you know, I, I've got no background in it as such. Um, you know, I rode ponies as a, as a young boy, um, but I went to agricultural college. Um, I went to do a land management course for three years. I stayed there three years. Um, and decided I didn't want to do farming, I didn't want to do land management, what am I going to do now? And um, I got a job with Ian Balding as a summer job, um, basically when I left college and ended up staying there three and a half years. And, and from there, I feel I just got lucky with who I worked for, when I worked for them. Um, you know, from Ian's, I went to um, Dick Hearn and I did the last year with Dick Hearn and, you know, I drove him everywhere, got to learn the administration side quite well um, and then I went to Ian Balding's um, sorry to Willie Muir's um, and stayed there for three years before coming to New Markets Luke Kamani's and then it was about time we we put our dipped our toe in the water yeah when you dipped your toe in the water you say you was quite lucky really really lucky so you know I've been at Lucas for three years um, didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't want to be an assistant for the rest of my life, but that was probably the reality. Um, my now wife, Jenny, um, came up with me. Um, she was an accountant. Um, and we talked about setting up training, um, and it seemed very unrealistic, but we put a plan together um, and a business proposal, and we wrote to six people in the local area, and. <laughs> Um, knew a yard, this yard was on the market and we bought the yard before, well, we, we had the yard bought for us before we'd uh, even thought about getting a horse. So it was a, it was a real, um, you know, it was a real adventure, if you like. Um, you know, I had no right to start training at the time. Um, didn't have any money, didn't have any horses um, and somebody had decided to back us. It's really interesting and like I hear little stories about you're very well known in the game for trading horses. Can you just tell me a little bit about the first horse that you bought cheaply? The very first one that put you on the road to understanding that there's money can be made at this. Sure, I mean I was still at Lucas at the time but um, there was a filly, a dance, um, she was inbred to Slightly Dangerous and we bought her for 1,500 quid at Tassels. We were going to keep her down the road, train her ourselves while we were working and see what we could do with her. Um, a couple of days later, we got a phone call from Terry Yoshida's um, racing manager, bloodstock agent, and um, they wanted her to fill a pallet to go to Japan. Um, and we were lucky enough that that 1,500 quid turned into a substantial amount of money and that's what we set up with. Um, and from there, probably trading's been our life, really. And how long ago was that? That was in 2003. 
Jesus. Mm. So there's a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money back then. It, it sort of, you know, we had something to start with, if you like. We had our, um, we had something to buy tack with. Yeah. Um, you know, to, um, you know, do my training co trainers courses, all that sort of thing. It all costs, um, and uh, and I can remember then having to go to the sales and find some horses. So like, we're all about grassroots level, and you, you know, that's for me that is starting at grassroots. So from what I understand, you you started with about ten horses. Can you? Yeah, I mean, it was seven actually, um, and I think five of which we owned ourselves. Um, most of them were paid for by credit card. <laughs> Back in the day when you max out a credit card and then you got another one and another one and another one, it was 0% interest. And, um, and So you really put yourself on the line? Totally, I mean, we, full commitment. Um, there were lots of days when you wondered why you'd done it, really, really were, how are you gonna pay the staff, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And we just battled away and you know, we, we, we had a good horse, good two-year-old in the first year that won at York um, that we paid, I think, 10000 for. And he was fourth in a good conditions race at Newmarket. And we took him to Dubai in the second year, um, first year of the carnival. And basically, it was the best thing we ever did. It got us an introduction to Dubai. Um, it got us an introduction to, you know, all the right people. people and find yeah. meeting new people yeah. um, and I, I met Khalifa Dasmal who's my longest serving owner that way and uh, and basically we sort of grew from there I think we had four winners in our second year and then we had ten winners in the third year and then sort of it was a gradual rise from there. Can I ask you David have you still got people owners I mean at grassroots level? Very much so um, John Cook, who had a horse in the first year, a filly called Alicia, that won in the second start at Goodwood. Um, he's been with me since day one. Sp and spends the same amount of money every year. Um, we buy 20, 30K horses. Um, and I would imagine he's one of the few people that have had a free ride out of racing for 17 years. Um, <laughs> he's been very lucky. He owned a horse called Breton Rock um, that he bought for 20K and I think won eight stakes races, was placed in numerous others and won 700,000 in prize money. Um, and then he's also traded horses and sold horses very well along the way. Um, we owned in partnership a filly called Breedenbury, which we sold to America. And that suddenly pays for two years of buying and training race horses. And you can't get it right every year. And you're gonna buy slow ones and there will be horses that you can't do a lot with. And, you know, he understood that, he understands it now, um, but um, he's also very happy that if there are 60 horse, we run it in 60 rated races, and if I get a good horse, fantastic, I get a good horse, and he just understands the game. And that's, that's what I hear a lot about. When I hear David Simcock, um, I, I like the fact that you, you're very well known for trading, tra trading on horses. You've sold some really nice horses and you've trained some you know, classic horses you know, if you could talk to us about Dream Ahead, obviously, every time you Google David Simcock, Dream Ahead, Dream Ahead. But you've also had a French Guineas winner um, and a few other really nice, nice horses. Yeah, without blowing my own trumpet, I think we've had 74 stakes winners. Jesus. Yeah. Um, and we've been, we've been very fortunate along the way. First good horse we had was a horse called Bushman, um, who we bought for 10,000 off Godolphin. And he won us three stakes races. I think he, my first group winner was at Epsom in the Diamond, and that was him. And um, he was a lot of fun. Um, and I think he was 2010. Um, and I probably got sort of my first real, if you do hit the media attention, but I had a horse that won the Cesarevich in 2009 called Dali Sun. And he started the year with a rating of, I think it was about 62. Um, and he won first time up at Nottingham. He, I got him beat along the way. He won a race called the Brown Jack by 10 lengths. Um, we waited for the Cesarevich weights to come out, put him in the Cesarevich and he was only a three-year-old. Um, 
when the weights came out, we ran him in the Doncaster Cup. Uh, and he got beaten in the neck in the Doncaster Cup. And Julie was, a, I think, about 18 pounds well in the Cesarovich and won it five lengths. Um, and he was sold to Godolphin thereafter. But that was the first time, sort of, like David Simcock. Um, mm. And then Bushman won his first group race the year later. Um, and then Dream Ahead came along. And probably That's a horse everyone knows. Everyone it turned into a stallion. Um, you know, if you can give us the the up, up the background on that, because that, that that's a horse that everybody uh, even now I still look at Dream Heads yeah, and think of you. <laughs> he's the horse I've got to be most grateful for. Probably, um, you know, he put us on the map. Um, you know, we bought him. I can remember standing in the office for my wife and Richard Brown being at Doncaster and saying, "There's a horse here he's, that's lame, but it's supposed to go very well." And um, we bought him for thirty-six thousand. Didn't have an owner for him. Um, rung up Khalifa Dasmal the next day and he took him and uh, the rest is history. We, we got him sound, um, he won his maiden by nine lengths and then, you know, we've done this quite a lot. We went into a group one on his second start, um, <laughs> pre morning and I think when you get a good horse you treat them like a good horse and um, he never ran out of group one company, um, ran nine times, won his maiden and five group ones and um, I think he's, he was joint champion two-year-old with Frankel, rated 126 as a two-year-old. And at the end of his three-year-old career, he finished off as 128, beating Golda Cobra in the foray. Um, just a wonderful horse to have around. And at the time, I don't think I appreciated it enough, but um, they don't come along very often. Can we just, we'll just talk about a couple of horses that you've got now that come to mind? Cash, who I watch up the gallops quite often and just looks an absolute machine. I thought he was very unlucky in his last run. Well, he was second, uh, what, what race was that? It was in the classic trial. Um, so Cash was a horse bought from France last year and won his maiden. Um, Who named him Cash? Um, the owner, Earl Mack, um, very <laughs> American. Um, I actually quite liked the name when he named it because we knew he was quite good. Um, and it's just a name that stands out. Uh, but when he won his maiden, it was a, it was a good performance. Very raw horse, um, well-bred horse, and um, again we we said we'd treat him like a good horse straight away. Yeah. And finding the right trial, um, Sandown's good test. It's a tough place to go, certainly on your second start. And um, you know we were confident he'd run well, but we didn't really quite know what we'd got. He ran very very well, and I'll just touch on the question of because um, a lot of our owners. Um, and, and we are group grassroots. A lot of people have said to me about Jamie Spencer riding him. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not here to knock any jockeys or anything. Do you think Jamie was the right jockey on the day? Very much so. I mean, what you've got to remember with Jamie, the horse comes first. Um, there's always another day. Not If we think he's a group one horse, what happens in a group three? Yes, it's important to a certain extent, but winning isn't everything on that particular day. This might be a horse you have around for the next two, three, four years. Yeah. Might be a horse you have around for the next race and he might be sold, I don't know. But whatever Jamie does, it's for the horse. And sometimes, you know, I've, I've used him since day one. He's got the most extraordinary strike rate for us. I think he's rides at 20, 22%. I think he's ridden 196 winners from 780 yeah. rides. He's ridden 20 stakes races for the yard. And he knows the horses as well as I do. Yeah. Um, and how he rides, he gets labelled as a hold-up jockey. Yes, he probably does ride hold-up horses most of the time. Um, but he's very good from the front. He's very good, you know, on yeah. a horse, sitting a yeah. horse in behind. But on that particular day, that horse was very fractious at the start. And he decided straight away he's going to be fresh, I'm going to ride this in a certain way that he's going to finish off and what will be will be. Would every horse gets beat by Franco. The horses get beat. Yeah. But that experience and what their first experience is is so important. From a punter's point of view, you're looking at it and thinking, well, he should have won. That bit is irrelevant to us. You know, that's, that's our, you know, these horses don't come along. It's different if you're Charlie Appleby and you've got 20 of them. We've got one of that type yeah, of horse. Yeah. Um, so I dislike 
horses going backwards in a race or getting really tired in a race and suddenly the last half furlong they're empty and they start going backwards at a race not and they get past yeah i look at it as a human it's demoralizing yeah so i want my horses to finish all the time um with jamie is probably brought that horse forward i think about eight nine ten pounds from his first run from doing what he's doing it's funny on the opposite scale mark johnson never gets criticized for sending his horses out in front and they might go too quick and stop nobody ever criticizes yeah, that yeah but we're looking at longevity horses finishing the whole time running consistently and their time will come you know the amount of horses tony that don't reach their optimum distance because they're either told right you go and sit second or third and suddenly they're very very free they put their head in the air they're pulling too hard you'll never get them yeah, to, yeah. to stay that optimum distance that's what we've got in mind you know i don't give jamie many instructions i tell him you know he's he's in most days he knows the horses very well but he'll get a feel of a horse going to start and if he thinks it right this is going to be fresh or this is going to be so he, he will say right you can conserve your energy and finish your race and if you get there fantastic yeah. if you don't you don't um and for us there's always another day to be honest with you it's a great explanation and obviously jamie's a very 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 good jockey because of, of what he's done and i actually watched an interview on um i think it was nick lucky was on one of these um i don't know jamie that well but he comes across so he's, he seems such a lovely person and his heart seems to be into the racing and the biggest point that's come out of that little bit from you is I do believe that the, the only people that really moan about them rides are the punters. Absolutely. And, and listen, they've got their right to their opinion. I don't like it. What I get upset is when people are nasty. People are always, you know, if they're having their 5, 10, 20, 50 pounds, whatever on, they're entitled to that opinion. Um, but there's a certain amount of, you know, they wouldn't know what's behind yeah, the scenes yeah. and everything There's a else. lot of nastiness. What goes, what, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and what goes on with a horse? You know, they're not all straightforward push-button horses. You know, these are these are hot. Top, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's he will be, and I understand it, and I, I understand the criticism to a certain extent, but Jamie loves horses, and he can feel horses, and he gets a feel for horses. And I think that's a dying art now. I really, yeah. really do. I think modern jockey can't tell you anywhere near as much i really really don't they might look pretty and you know they might um he's got a hell of a lot of experience hasn't he jamie he's been all over the world listen he was riding group one runners as a 17 yeah. year old yeah and he still loves it as much now as he did then yeah that's lovely to hear um before we move on to other subjects um how many horses would you say you've got here in training at the moment so in Trillium, we'd have 70 training. So everything in Trillium's in full work. And then we have a second yard, um, three quarters of a mile away, um, called Ravida, where there'd be 24, 25. Um, and they are basically horses that are either coming back from injury or spelling or having time off, um, having a rest, um, and basically on lighter exercise. And the horses from this yard would basically train majority of the time on Warren Hill, train, horses on the other yard would train on the flat. Um, so it works well and we, um, we split the staff between the two. Can I, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about as well, something for us at Grassroots, because I run, obviously you know I run a syndicate myself. Mm. Um, your thoughts on, the f people say the first profit is the best, pro best profit. What, what do you think on that? Um, from our point of view, we've always had to sell. You know, we, we're first generation trainers. Um, it's been, it's, you know, for me, the margin on training fees is very, very little. We charge, I'm very happy to say, 65 pounds a day. When there are others in town that are charging 75, 78, 80, 80 pounds plus. Um, but we still have those owners that we've had since day one and when we started we were 35 pounds a day and you know we feel we've had to keep everything sort of at a modicum so 
the margin on training fees for us is zero. It is absolutely zero. Um, so you rely on trading the winnings? Very much so. So the biggest overhead is obviously staff and staff has to, we have to keep it, and we might laugh, but 47, 48% of our income. So um, after that, it's feed, shavings and everything else. Yeah. So we have to run a very strict business. So to pay for our yards and try and make money, we have to trade. And every year we will look to sell as much as we possibly can. We obviously want to keep the best horses. Yeah, Everybody does. Yeah. Um, that was the question, really. Where the, the differential between... Fine line. Yeah, it's yeah. a very fine line. And in my small syndicate, we're starting to be made offers on things now. And, and at grassroots level, the, the question is that, do you jump or do you... It's something you have to make a decision between, between you and the trainers. Uh, very much so, and it's the trainer's call at the end of the day. Um, you know, you, you have to make a valuation on the horse. You have to make that call on how good you think the horse could be. And it, that's a very, you're not trying to find out this is the best horse I've ever had. Because if you're doing that, you're doing too much. Yeah. You know, horses will, you know, mature. Some will be later developers than others. And it's very hard, it's a very hard thing to gauge. Um, you know, but the one thing I've always said is never be frightened to sell. You know, if you're getting, if you're selling a horse and you're getting what you want at the time, fantastic. And then it's good luck to the next person. And if they go on, you know, so be it. There'll be some horses that don't go on and you're selling them. You yeah, know, at the right time. Absolutely. And you've got um, out on the door shuts. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you'll have a gut feel for it, I think. And I think you have to use the trainer's knowledge and um, expertise, if you like, of saying, well, this is where I think this will be in six months or 12 months. And the value of that horse might be considerably less in two or three yeah, runs time yeah, than it is yeah. now. It's a very difficult question. Um, I'd like to move just to ask you, as I run a syndicate, what are your thoughts on um, syndicates uh, in general, uh, micro shares uh, along them? Uh, this is something that I'm fighting with all the time because I run a syndicate. I'm, and uh, yeah, I'm a great advocate of the syndicate. I think the syndicate is the way forward. I think it is the future. Um, it makes it affordable. And at the end of the day, we're providing you know, we're providing a service of enjoyment. And I think with the syndicate, you get that. Um, I think management comes in, becomes very, very important. Um, but I'm a great believer syndicates shouldn't be thousands and thousands of people. They should be a group that can get enjoyment out of each other. It's a way of meeting people. Um, and I'm a big advocate of the high clears of this world. Um, your syndicate's done very well, and there's several out there. Um, and they're producing good horses. You know, yeah. the guineas this this year was the thousand guineas was won by a syndicate this year. I think that's the most great, great yeah, fantastic. Of You're seeing what's happening in America, in Australia. Um, syndicate syndications have absolutely taken off. They've made it affordable, um, and they're competing at the top level. And that's that's what basically that's what everybody wants to do. Um, now, micro shares, I'm not a fan of at all. Um, for me, you're not getting the involvement. You're not getting the, I think, the experience of racehorse ownership. Um, and for me, people are making way too much money out of it. And I think the people that join these microshare syndicates don't realise quite what's happening. Yeah, that's something. I've been actually working with the BHA, with Tim Naylor. Um, trying to get some of this because it's just, it's not regulated at all. People are jumping on the bandwagon, they're seeing people make a lot of money um, and they're buying, a, uh, this is the bit really, they're buying a horse for £1,500 at the sales, sales and they're selling £250,000 worth of shares. People, and people are naive to the fact, and quite rightly naive to the fact, they don't understand the industry but, and it's, it's, um, but do you think there should be regulation in place to stop that? The problem is I don't see how it can be regulated. I, 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 I don't know what the BHA can do something like, with something like that. Um, 
as long as the person buying the micro share is aware of what's happening, I don't think there's any anything that can be done. I'll reiterate, and it's an important fact, they need to know what's happening though. Yeah. And they need to know, actually, this is all you've got. And basically, you might get a ticket to the races and you yeah. might get some information, but that's all you're gonna yeah. get. Yeah, I think it needs to be um, much more transparent in that, the advertising the and everything. And that's the bit that I'm working on. Um, and for us, we've got probably 200 members and it works really well. Very transparent, yeah. very simply run. But the, just lately, it's getting worse and worse. These micro shares, where basically all you're paying is a micro share only lasts a year, and you're basically just paying for the training of that horse for one year. Absolutely. You know, when I see some of these really good horses come to the front, see, my belief is um, syndicates are the way forward. 60% of the horses they tell me are syndicated horses in the country now. So I think it should be more regulated. Uh, it, I would say it's something that needs to be looked at going forward. I haven't given this enough thought. We have, we've had syndicates and we have syndicates and I actually find them fun. It's, it's nice going racing when you've got a group of people yeah. and you can enjoy. But, you know, a lot of that is down to, you know, the experience they're going to get from how it's managed and, and the trainer. It, it, you know, you've got to embrace the whole thing and you can't go there with a feeling, you know, I've had a bad day or whatever. You're providing that service and, you know, it's, um, I'm with you. I think it's, it's definitely the way forward and I think it's going to become more and more prominent in the years to come. Yeah, good. Yeah, and the last question I'd like to ask really is your thoughts on how the UK racing is going with this horses all being sold abroad, races being cut, etc. It seems like every, in every direction I'm looking at the moment, British racing is going downhill very fast. I think we're, we're going through a transitional stage. That's what I really, really believe. Um, and we have to go through this transitional stage. Uh, we have become a nursery for horses to go abroad. Um, in the fact there's a massive demand for foreign racing, which probably wasn't there 10, 20 years ago. You know, you've got Bahrain, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, um, Hong Kong. You only have to read about the reports and the betting turnover and what's happening there. Um, but do you think this is a lot to do with prize money? It, it is to a certain extent. It's also the demand for the best horses in the world. Um, you know, Australia's really, you know, become huge. Um, the prize money levels at these places, you know, World Cup night, what's, what you're racing for in Australia, what you're racing for in Hong Kong. Um, they need the good horses to, um, to race in those particular races. Now, everybody knows British racing is so far and above the most competitive racing in the world. It really, really is. It doesn't matter where you're racing, it's competitive. Um, we breed the best horses. Um, and we probably produce the best horses and in my opinion they're probably trained better here than anywhere else in the world um, we're, we're far more drug free than anywhere else um, and everybody knows that if they get through the nursery in the initial stage they've got a good horse sound horse to go to war with that are going to race for millions well we haven't got that we haven't got that model here. We've got the horses, but we haven't got um, the product that we are. Um, that we are. We can't. We can't um, compete with the prize money. But do you? You know, for me as a business person, I think looking looking at the way horse racing is run by the BHA in the UK, looking at how, how much money is taken out of racing before it gets to the track, I think that's a lot. A lot. Looking at it from our grassroots level, looking up. Yeah, well, m many mistakes were made in the last 25, 30, 35 years. Um, you know, the sales of the tote, um, you know, giving the race course the power um, that they have, um, how the levy is generated and the percentages that come from the bookmakers. Um, there's so many changes that need to be made that probably can't be made and those decisions were made probably before our time. Um, 
you know, we need a percentage of betting turnover at the end of the day, and we're not getting that. And um, the media rights, we used the word transparency earlier. There's no transparency. We don't know where that money goes. Um, we know, you know, the race courses are extremely profitable. Um, so changes will have to be made. Um, and like I said, you know, this probably this next 10 years is going to be very, very transitional. Um, and hopefully, you know, there's there's people out there that can do something about it and, and change the model. Can you see anybody coming forward to? Um, it's very difficult to see it happening. I don't think without government legislation, we're not going to see a, a change in what we get from the bookmakers with regards to betting turnover. Um, and we had legislative, we went to the government four years ago and we got an extra 30, 40 million and everybody patted themselves on the back. Well, that should have been a far greater number. Where did it go? Uh, absolutely. And then COVID hits and that's their excuse. Yeah. Um, and the only light at the end of the tunnel possibly is the new tote pool, world pool. Um, yeah. And if that can take off and suddenly be, suddenly, you know, race days are betting into a pool and we can have a percentage of that, well, you know, that might be a positive. But um, that seems to be, it doesn't seem to be happening as quick as what everybody wants it to because they want it to happen quickly. But, you know, there's a chance that this might happen, opening up our racing to, you know, Hong Kong and the likes, and America and, um, you know, them betting into a worldwide pool, which is big, um, suddenly it's a way yeah. of generating hopefully more money. Change is taking so long, it just worries me about racing in the UK. Yeah. And for us at Grassroots, we don't really get any recognition. We really don't. You know, we talk, we're talking, you're going to Wolverhampton to £2,000 prize money and, and, and stuff like that. It's, it's just demoralising, really. It is, but I look at it in a different way. A different way. I'm, I've been in that fortunate position where I've trained, I still train a 60 horse and I enjoy training a 60 horse and winning with it. Yeah. And we've had the group horses. And I'm very much realised that for one owner, that 60 horse is so important. And for another owner, that group horse is so important. Yeah. And you get the best return you can winning as much prize money with the 60 horse and the other horse will yeah, do its yeah. job and I think you train what's put in front of you and you get the best results and you win as much prize money as you possibly can which is hard. Lovely. Well I'd like to thank you very much David honestly inviting us into your lovely stables and showing us around. You're a true gentleman I'll say that on, on camera I love you to bits so does my wife and um, thank you very much. No, it's brilliant it's been great having you guys and um, like I said, it's always a pleasure seeing you guys around. Follow all your horses. Um, I think you've got a great man at the helm. In Created Tom by yourself. Yeah, who <laughs> worked for me for five years. But um, listen, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, what's nice is to see the rise of the Rose Gallery over the last four or five years. And yeah, what's we're happening now. now. It's great. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Cheers. Brilliant, mate. Great, great man. Thank you very much.